Today's presenters are Herb Schuneman and Katie Tran. You, remember, you may remember Herb from the last webinar on reliability testing. Katie has been a lab manager here at West as a lab manager here at Westpac and has been with us for nine years. Herb is president and CEO and has been here since the beginning of Westpac. Katie, take it away. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm Katie. Thank you for taking valuable time of your day to join us in this webinar. So let's get started. Here is our agenda. We'll talk about ISO 11607, popular test method, ISO 11607 Part 1, Annex B. Future test method change, FDA recognition, conclusions. Herb, would you like to add some comments? Uh, thanks, Katie. It's important to note that this is a FDA recognition, not a FDA regulation. The FDA doesn't uh, make regulations in these regards. Basically, what we're doing here is, uh, is is saying that the FDA wants to be able to recognize that you've done the job correctly of identifying exactly how you're going to validate the, uh, the performance and the sterility of the package system at the customer's location. So it's an important uh, distinction. I just want to make sure that that was uh, well known. Katie? So let's go on to the next slide. So let's talk about what is ISO 11607 for people who aren't familiar with it. Like her mentioned, it is a guidance document for validating terminally sterilized medical devices, and FDA recognizes it. If you're wondering what ISO stands for, it is an international organization for standardization. Herb, do you want to give us a perspective of ISO 11607? Yeah, it's important also to recognize and to remember that uh, ISO 11607 is basically what we've been doing all along with medical devices uh, and a number of other products as well, uh, putting the ISO, International Standards Organization, label on it tends to lead a great deal of credibility because of the significance of that international organization. The testing, however, is basically the same or very similar to what has been going on for a long time. Uh, also, we've noticed that ISO tends to be a very, mm, I'll call it aggressive marketing organization. Uh, other standards writing groups, uh, ASTM is one of them, American Society for Testing and Materials. And that organization is more than twice as old or more um, than uh, ISO, yet it's probably less well known. Uh, ASTM will often suggest their standards. Uh, ISO tends to dictate their standards. Just a little background information. Katie? Thanks for the background, Herb. So the next question is, do I need to use ISO 11607? If you have a sterilized medical device which must perform efficiently, safely, and effectively in the hands of your user, the answer is yes. Before we continue, Herb, do you want to add something? Um, up to, often people ask us, do I have to use these standards? Well, we normally say it's a good idea to use the standard whenever a medical device is placed on the market, especially one that uh, is guaranteed to be sterile uh, and has uh, an expiration date. Uh, this also includes uh, products that are marketed uh, over the counter. We've had some questions about that already and those devices that are intended to be marketed or sold on the web. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be shipped to a hospital or clinic in order to use the standard. Uh, almost any distribution cycle uh, is relevant for uh, ISO 11607. Katie? So the next slide talks about revision of ISO 11607. The previous revision was in 2003. The current revision, what they have done is they divided they revised it technically, then divided it into two parts. So now there is ISO 11607 Part 1 and ISO 11607 Part 2. And the current revision is 2006. Herb, would you like to add something? A little bit of background there. Most standards are reviewed on a regular basis. For example, ASTM standards must be reviewed every 10 years and updated as appropriate. The requirements for ISO are similar, but there are the exact numbers unknown at least to me. A revision, so that's an update, a revision of the standard is another story. Okay, uh, Revisions um, occur when there's a moderate or significant change uh, to the procedure. 
um, changing the method, changing the materials, or similar. So the proper name for any standard must also include its revision history. That's why uh, Katie said in the previous uh, version it was uh, ISO 11607-2003. Uh, so the current revision is 2007. So make sure that the, either a dash number for ASTM standards or it's a colon typically for ISO standards. But those last, uh, last digits are important because they tell you the revision history and after a significant revision, that things might have changed, so make sure that's part of the standard number. Katie? Before I continue, it seems like Greg wants to... Um, yeah, we have a question from the audience. Um, is, are, is ISO expecting to release a new document for 11607 in 2014? Is there any um, news on the, front, on the front on the news about that? As of right now, we haven't heard anything about revision, so we're not expecting any change in the near future. We're talking about one to two years in the near future because we are not aware of that. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the ISO 11607 document. This document is Packaging for Terminally Sterilized Medical Devices. As I mentioned in the previous slide and her mentioned again, there are two parts. Part one is the requirement for material, sterile barrier system, and packaging systems. Part two is validation requirements for forming, sealing, and assembly processes. And Herb, would you like to add something? Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> many, many people <clears throat> question the um, the uh, emphasis placed on the uh, packaging of medical devices in general. Remember that a device is, uh, is no good unless it can be delivered to a customer at the client's location, uh, typically a far distance from the manufacturer, and that this delivery process is perhaps the most rigorous and hazard-filled time of the product's entire life cycle. This is where the product will, in fact, be tested, whether or not you test it in the laboratory. The environment will test it. So validating the forming, sealing, and assembly process is, uh, um, is really the proof of the pudding uh, and that the things were done correctly. And so that's where we're going to place our, our emphasis today. Katie? So let's talk about part one. Part one specified the basic attribute required of materials and preformed system intended for use in packaging system for terminally sterilized medical devices. So in order to talk about this, we have to talk about sterile barrier system. What is a sterile barrier system? It allows for sterilization, provides physical protection, maintains sterility up to the point of use, allow aseptic presentation. And I'm pretty sure that Herb loves to talk about sterilization. Well, you're so right, Katie. Holy cow. She's got me pegged. The sterilization uh, techniques uh, used in the medical device business uh, largely dictate the performance characteristics of the package system itself, namely a barrier through which a uh, gas can pass, uh, but microbes and uh, viruses and similar things cannot. Um, this, uh, we've been, been awaiting news of new sterilization techniques for years, decades perhaps or longer, but we're still stuck with uh, ethylene oxide gas as the primary method of medical device sterilization until uh, things like antimicrobial films are, per are perfected we'll be uh, basically stuck using this uh, uh, spun bond polyolefin which is the generic name for what most of us recognize as Tyvek. Tyvek is, is, the, uh, is the trade name used by the manufacturer of that particular material. The, uh, the physical the protection provided by most medical device package systems is, is really minimal. And by physical protection, I mean shock and vibration. This is largely because most devices tend to be rather robust mechanically from the start. So um, in addition, this, uh, this aseptic uh, presentation of a product into a sterile field by means of a pouch or a peelable tray is something that is continually sought after by professionals, primarily nurses in the hospital. And if you've been to conferences where these nurses have spoken, you know that they're very adamant about that. So let's continue with the process. Katie? So as her mentioned earlier, it's applicable to not just the healthcare industry. It is to wherever medical devices are placed in sterile barrier system and sterilized. 
ISO 11607 Part 1 does not cover all the requirements for cerebrary system and package system for medical devices that are manufactured aseptically. Herb, would you want to add something? Uh, yes, for those not familiar with the, this term, uh, aseptic uh, manufacturing, it's very interesting and in a, in a, it is an interesting and appealing method for creating a, a device and inserting it into a package without the introduction of foreign materials, including viruses and microbes at all. That's perhaps the most desirable method of producing a sterile uh, medical device. Uh, unfortunately, uh, aseptic manufacturing is not applicable to most complex devices. Therefore, it's really out of the scope of this particular webinar. However, uh, if uh, any of our listeners are interested in this process and would like to know more about it, you can email either Katie or myself and we'll respond with any information we can find. Katie? So we just finished talking about part one. Let's go to part two. As Herb mentioned, part two is not part of this webinar as it describes the validation requirements for forming, sealing, and assembly processes. Our focus of our webinar is ISO 11607 Part 1, Annex B. We want to emphasize that this Annex B is not intended to be all-inclusive, and we'll go into details of why. As I mentioned before, ISO 11607 current revision is 2006. There are a couple categories in Annex B we will go over. Accelerating conditioning, integrity, internal pressure, performance testing, puncture, seal shrink, and visual inspection. For some of the audience who don't have products that need to be sterilized and wonder if listening to the remaining of the slides would be beneficial, I will say yes, as there are some test methods that will be going over that will apply for sterile and non-sterile products. So let's begin. First category is accelerated aging. The standard is ASTM F1980. Current revision is 2007, and the previous revision is 2002. And there are changes between the latest revision. First, the removal of package shelf life test plan flowchart. Second, clarify that you do not need to use actual product for accelerated aging. Third, clarify aging, also known as stability testing and performance testing, are separate entities. And Herb will let go over accelerated aging. It's important to note, uh, Katie, that the, the process of accelerated aging is based on the Arrhenius equation, which uh, many of you are familiar with, I'm sure. It states briefly that the molecular activity in an organic molecule will approximately double with every 10 degrees C rise in ambient temperature. So the validity or application of this particular equation for acceleration aging of medical devices and other products has been and likely will be for some time in the future hotly debated. Uh, it is, however, acceptable for F, uh, FDA submission when combined with real-time aging to validate the accelerated aging process in smaller increments. And we're going to talk about those in general. So, Katie, what does this uh, flowchart look like anyway? I actually have a diagram of the flowchart. So this is the flowchart that was listed in the 2002 revision. So it starts off where you produce the package, send it to sterilization, you do your accelerated aging, and then you do your distribution, followed by bubble testing and kill testing. So in the current revision, which is 2007, the flowchart is removed. So the next category is conditioning. The standard is ASTM D4332. The current revision is 2013. The previous revision is 2001. There are no changes to the testing procedure, but there are some editorial changes. And since this is relating to conditioning, Herb has a passion for it. Hmm, passion sounds interesting. Uh, but it is important to recognize that uh, temperature and humidity extremes are the most common hazard encountered in any distribution environment. You said, and, and you all know that when it gets real hot and or real cold outside. So. It's a, a very important and fundamental step that should never be overlooked or minimized. Uh, we, we go through weather all the time, so we tend to minimize it, but its effects on a product should never be overlooked or uh, discounted in any way. Temperature, and especially temperature and humidity extremes, are in general the most hazardous portion of any distribution environment. Katie? 
As I mentioned before, there are no changes to the testing procedure. However, there are some editorial changes. So let's start. First, they added extreme conditioning at minus 30 degrees C to table 1. On the top left right here, this is the 2001 revision. Here are some of the conditions that you can choose. In the 2013 revision, they added the extreme cold, which is minus 30 degrees C. This is another selection that you can choose. Herb, do you want to add? I think it's important, Katie, to um, let everyone know that the reason for this uh, cold temperature uh, or extreme cold temperature insertion is that it tends to be rather common. Uh, we didn't really realize that apparently with the earlier versions. But the addition of this extreme cold environment is significant because most medical devices uh, incorporate uh, or uh, they normally utilize heavily polymeric devices, plastics, that are or could be extremely sensitive to temperature fluctuations. And they tend to get brittle when they get cold. So therefore, the, this, uh, this addition uh, of the cold temperature environment from minus 18 to minus 30 degrees C is potentially very significant. Katie? So they also removed table 2. It is no longer there. So here is a picture of the packages placed in a calibrated chamber and the engineer programs the profile as requested. And Herb, would you like to talk about the placement of these packages? Why, how'd you guess, Katie? N uh, note in the photograph, you, you see that uh, there are two chambers, two, two boxes in this chamber, two container systems, but there's a significant airflow all around all six faces of the container, and that the shelf in the bottom of the container is, in fact, uh, porous. It's made of wire rather than a solid surface. It's important because airflow around the entire uh, container system is important. Typically, a test procedure will involve about 24 hours of uh, exposure to a given environment. So without proper airflow, it's, it's uh, likely that the product will not be completely conditioned um, or it won't be completely exposed to that condition unless there's sufficient airflow. So make sure when you're running these tests that you have sufficient airflow in the chamber. And like I said before, temperature winds up being one of the most important hazards to be encountered. So it's important to make sure you do it correctly. Katie? Before we continue, Greg, do you have something for us? Yeah, um, we have a question from the audience. Do you know why the uh, flow charts were removed from ISO 11607? Is, did they give a particular reason in the red wine version? Um, or is there another reason that they might have removed them? Uh, let me take a stab at that. Um, it's a good question. Thank you for submitting it. Uh, my suspicion, only that, is that the, uh, the flow chart tended to minimize the validation uh, available with real-time aging. So the real-time aging should be uh, coordinated with accelerated aging in small increments in order to validate that process. So that's, that's only my suspicion. I've not heard anyone talk about it directly, but that, you know, if you notice that chart did not include any, any uh, mention of real-time aging, and yet it is uh, an important portion of that validation process. So that's my suspicion only. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so the next category we'll be talking about is integrity. This is, I want to emphasize that this test method is detecting seal leaks in porous medical packaging using the dye penetration. For those that do not know what a porous medical packaging, it means that you have a material that allows for um, differential pressure going through, like air going past through it. You can have a Tyvek or a paper on one side of your packaging, then that is considered as porous. The standard is ASTM F1929, the current revision is 2012, and the previous revision is 1998. In this revision, they added two more test methods called the edge dip and eyedropper method. The method listed in 1998 is now called injection. Herb, do you know why these two methods were added? It was, it was for the convenience of running the test on uh, odd-shaped products, uh, Katie. Um, sometimes it's just much easier to you know, dip an edge in than it is to insert a uh, uh, syringe into the package and inject it, such as we show on the next slide. Um, we have a question from the audience back um, relating to conditioning. 
Does conditioning always come prior to distribution? Are there cases where you should condition after the distribution test? Most of the time we will condition prior to the distribution testing. The reason why is that when you're doing conditioning, you are subjecting mainly your corrugated material along with your product to extreme conditioning. So it, if you condition your samples before you do distribution, it will have an effect during compression, drops, and vibration. So we recommend doing conditioning before. Herb, do you have any input? You're right on, Katie. Um, it tends to, to be shown over and over again that the distribution testing will produce a more vigorous result, a conservative result, if you will, uh, if it's conducted after uh, the, uh, the well, if the sequence of events is conditioning first and then transit testing. So that's generally why it's uh, included in the sequence that it is, namely prior to the actual distribution testing produces a more conservative result. Great. Thanks, guys. One more question on the dye penetration test. Um, do you get additional information from dye testing versus gross leak bubble testing? That is a great question. So we are only on integrity testing, and then I will go over more in detail for the bubble testing in a couple slides. So in case I forget, Greg will have to remind me about the question again. So hold on. Okay. Will do, Katie. Thank you. So let's go back to dye penetration testing on porous medical packaging. As her mentioned um, earlier that we will have a couple pictures. So as you can see, this is the injection test method. And what you do is that you use a syringe, take your dye penetrant in there, inject it into this medical packaging. As I mentioned before, it has to be porous. So this is a thermoform tray with a Tyvek lid. So you inject inject the dye penetrant in there and you observe for channel leaks. And there is a video on our Westpac website that you can see this test method being done. Herb, would you like to add something? Sure. I, I, I'd like to point out that the dye that uh, Katie mentioned is, is uh, called out in the standard. It's a high surfactant level of a material with a horrible purple color. That's my personal evaluation. Um, and, and it will wick into any small channels uh, very readily. Um, and because porous packages have you know, these very small channels on them, that's how it becomes porous, the procedure suffers from what I call a time relevance in that the dipenetrant solution will wick into the porous materials uh, such as Tyvek uh, readily over time. And it also makes a mess um, or potentially could make a mess. Uh, so it's important to uh, read the test quickly. Uh, it is it is very time sensitive. Katie, okay. great. Do you have a question for us? Um, we do. For dye penetration testing, should um, all three test methods be conducted, or should one of the methods be selected? So with the new revision for dye penetration, they create different methods. So most of the time, the injection method would apply. So let me go on to the next slide to better answer this question. So this is the edge dip method, and as her mentioned a couple minutes ago that this method is more appropriate if there are no extra material on the package. So edge dip is used mainly for the left side of the seal and the right side of the seal because there's no extra material. So you dip the seal and then as her mentioned, there's a surfactant involved that it will, if there's a channel leak, the capillary function would draw the blue liquid to that area and tell you that there is a channel leak. Does that answer the question? Um, I think so. I think it's just you select one of the three methods, you don't do all three, correct? Correct. You select okay. one of three methods. Great. Thank you. So the next test method for integrity is detecting leaks in non-porous packaging by data penetration. This is a new standard. It is ACM F3039. Current revision is 2013. There is no previous revision as this is the initial release of the standard. As I mentioned a couple slides ago, that was for porous packaging. This is for non-porous packaging. So when you say non-porous, what, what do I mean? 
it is basically poly poly or foil foil. And the procedure is that you inject dye penetrant that is made slightly different to the other standard at a volume of 0 0.25 milliliter per inch of the silhouette. This is the minimal volume inject to it. Before we proceed, I would like to know how many of our audience know of this standard, or is this the first time? So if this is the first time that you heard of this standard, please raise your hand so Greg can let us know the result in a few minutes. Um, Katie, while we wait for those results to come in, i uh, got a quick question. How long do you leave the dye on the seals for both um, the porous and non-porous? As her mentioned earlier, for the porous packaging, Tyvek or material or paper has a wicking factor, so it's five seconds per seal. And the same thing applies for the non-porous package as well. So give you an idea of five seconds. If there is a channel leak, the minute that the dye penetrant hit that area, you will see the leak. Great. Thanks, Katie. It looks like about 25% um, of the folks have heard of the new um, standard. So. It's, it's good we're mentioning it here, I think. Thanks, Greg. So let's continue. So the next category is internal pressure. This is another popular test method detecting gross leak in packaging by internal pressurization, aka bubble testing. The standard is ASTM F2096. The current revision is 2011. The previous revision is 2001. What changes were made is the first one is you do not need to place the airflow in the center of the package. The reason why they removed this requirement is because when you are testing a pouch with a product inside, it is very difficult if the center of the package has your device to inject airflow in it. They did change the testing procedure. They added that you have to rotate the packages 180 degrees. If you have been testing with Westpac and requesting us to do bubble testing, this does not affect Westpac. As we have been doing this procedure before this latest revision of 2011, requesting that. But if you are testing at another facility or you're doing it internally, you might want to look at the standard. Um, Herb, would you want to talk about how this test method is being done? Uh, thanks, Katie. Uh, it's being done underwater. Can you imagine that? Uh, the t a testing of a porous membrane with, uh, with a kind of a, a porous membrane test, if you will, this pressurization underwater, it's kind of like blowing up a balloon with a bunch of holes already in it. So I want to emphasize that it takes a fair amount of expertise to discern a true leak, uh, what we call a channel leak, from the normal breathing patterns. So basically you, you expect the, the product to leak. You just don't expect it to leak a lot in one particular place. So it takes a fair amount of, uh, of uh, you know, expertise and experience to determine the difference between those two on a regular basis. And this rotation that uh, Katie mentioned is something that we've been doing for a long time because it simply helps us uh, identify what is, in fact, a true leak. When you have a big pouch and a, and a, and a bunch of uh, bubbles playing on it, and believe me, you got a lot to look at there. So it's, it's, a, it's somewhat of a challenging process. It sounds pretty simple. Blow it up and look for the bubbles. Uh, the reality is it's a little more difficult than that. Katie? Before we move on, Greg, is there more questions? I um, just wanted to circle back to the bubble versus dye testing. Um, what additional information in, in need do you get using dye versus bubble testing? You beat me to the punch. That will be the next slide. So before I explain the difference of them, here's a picture of a porous package. As I mentioned before, porous package is one side with Tyvek or paper. It is, like her mentioned, that it is submerged in water. And you blow air into it, looking for streaming bubbles coming out of it. There is a video on our website that will show you what it looks like. So going back to the question from the audience, when you do a bubble testing, you detect if there are any gross leaks and channel leaks like Herb mentioned before. So it looks at the whole package. The distinction with dye penetration is that it only looks for channel leaks. So it only looks for seal channel leaks. 
So dye penetration is used mainly for seal validation when you're trying to see if there's any leak across the seal width. Bubble testing is known to our customer as being the sterile barrier testing because you look at the whole package, the seals, the pouch, the material, everything else. Herb, would you like to add something? So, moving on. We're going to talk about the next category, which is performance testing. This, I'm pretty sure people heard of it at one point in their time. It is ASTM D4169. The current revision is 2009. The previous revision is 2008. There are some changes to this document. The first thing they did was they changed the verbiage to consider the use of ASTM D7386 for single partial shipment. They increased the weight limit for distribution cycle 12 and 13 from 100 pounds to 150 pounds. They clarify what is a non long, narrow shipping unit. So according to them, a long, narrow shipping unit is a package with a length greater than or equal to 36 inches, both the width and the height is less than or equal to 20%. Why do they want to clarify what is a long, narrow shipping unit? If your package falls into this category, that means you will need to do a bridge impact testing. And you're wondering, what is a bridge impact testing? So imagine that you're shipping TV and you have this big screen TV. And you know that most of the time, the structural support are on the corners. And so they're worried that in case something were to happen, like a hazard drop in the middle, the middle structure is not supporting and your product can be damaged. So that's why they want to clarify that. And if you follow in that category, bridge impact testing is required. There are no changes to the testing procedure. Herb, would you like to talk about the history of ASTM D4169? Well, certainly would, Katie. Thank you. Uh, 4169 was a, uh, an attempt oh, probably 30 years ago or, or more uh, to take the most recent distribution environment information and incorporate it into a standard that uh, included the, the levels uh, and the sequence of those hazard inputs from the distribution environment into a test procedure. Uh, it took, uh, gosh, 12 years to develop the standard, and uh, it, uh, it, it, it's widely recognized worldwide. Most standards are based on it. Uh, Katie also mentioned that the ISO 11607 uh, suggests or, or at least mentions the use of a uh, uh, similar uh, what's called pre-shipment test procedure, ASTM D7386. The two of them are very similar, quite honestly. I, I refer to them as Coke and Pepsi, although I've been criticized for that in the past. Um, but the important thing to recognize is that uh, these procedures, both of them, are designed to measure the ability of a package system to survive distribution by on a truck or a rail car or aircraft, doesn't matter. Think of it this way, however, the, the, the truck or the rail car or the aircraft doesn't care what's in the package. It's just a box. Okay, so the same environment occurs. So that's why it has a lot of uh, validity in that it's uh, it's important to uh, get a, a non-biased view, if you will. You can't say to a truck, "Hey, be careful or be gentle," because this is a, a a medical device after all. I mean, people's lives are depending on this. Truck doesn't care. Aircraft doesn't care. The rail car doesn't care. Guaranteed. So these procedures are important because they. They take that same ambiguity and apply it to any device that's uh, any package is going to ship, and it, it normally results in, in a very good uh, decision-making process at the end, and that's why it's important. Uh, Katie, before we move on, I'd like to know how many people are using the ASTM D4169. So, if you can, please raise your hand so Greg can collect the results. So. For those who know about ASTM D4169, there are a lot of substandards in this document. We listed a few here. Because of the time limit we have for this webinar, I just want to display this. If you want to know more details about this, please do not hesitate to contact me. So another performance testing method that Herb already mentioned, it is the ASTM D7386. This is the performance testing of packages for single partial delivery system. The current revision is 2012. The previous revision is 2008. It was the initial release of this document. 
There are no changes to the testing procedure, just references update. I want to point out that ASTM D7386 is not currently listed in ISO 11607. The reason why is because ISO 11607 latest revision is 2006, and this document was released in 2008. If you are using this standard, don't panic. We'll go over the reason why you're okay and you're safe. So. As well, we would like to know how many of our audience are using ASTM D7386, so if you can raise your hand and Greg will collect that results as well. Um, we, Katie, we have the D4169 results. It looks like about 22% of the folks listed in a day are currently using D4169. So it's going to be interesting to see about the 7386 who's using it. So great. Thanks. Thank you. So another performance testing known as the ISTA series. We have the 1, 2, and 3. These standards get updated on a yearly basis, so it's hard to keep update because the minute we talk about this webinar, there could be a change coming on. So if you want to know what are changes and what are the current revision, again, please do not hesitate to contact us. And again, if you are using ISTA standard for your testing method, can you please raise your hand because we want to see how many of our audience are using it. And Herb, would you like to share some background and history about the ISTA series? Boy, you're reading my mind, Katie. Um, strangely enough, ISTA is the oldest of all the standards in the whole process. Um, it, it actually started out as the uh, National, or actually Safe Transit Committee. It was a result of legislation in the 1920s, believe it or not, the so-called trust-busting legislation. Uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act was part of that, et cetera. Out of that process grew this, as I said, the Safe Transit Committee, which came up with a, a bunch of test procedures for actuarial uh, insurance rates on, on uh, for carriers. Uh, it's grown over the years, and the current uh, name of the organization is International Safe Transit Association, ISDA. Uh, wonderful standards. They started out with uh, two originally, and then they grew to two more. The two were for domestic, small and big, and then they at an international, so that's what was the one and one A and the two and the two A. Currently, there's oh, over thirty of those darn things. Um, we're often asked which standards should be used. Um, we have heard, and you have probably heard as well, that uh, standards such as the ASTM D seventy three eighty six or forty one sixty nine tend to be favored by folks at the FDA, for example primarily because they are consensus standards. What does, that, what does that mean? It means there's a bunch of people sitting around the table and these people are balanced in terms of their interest, whether they're interested in the, uh, in, in the production of, of equipment for it, whether they're interested in the, the, the uh, standards itself, or whether they have a general interest. And, and that balanced group of people then have to agree on the standard. In other words, if they disagree on one component of it and, it and their disagreement is considered to be viable, they have to basically uh, figure out what they can do to get around that information. So consensus standard it was, is, is often considered to be, uh, in some cases, the least common denominator that everyone can agree on. The, uh, and that's true. And I think for, for, the, for, the, for the good of the, of the standard, perhaps. Uh, the ISTA standards are created by a committee within that particular organization, uh, people who are knowledgeable in the test procedures and, and the distribution environment. But it's not a consensus standard, and that's the big hang-up. Now, I know that the ISTA folks are currently working on that with the FDA uh, and have been for some time, uh, but the exact uh, results or, or uh, you know, uh, current status is unknown. The bottom line is what you have to do as a medical device manufacturer is validate what you do and why you do it, not necessarily what procedures that you use. So if you can create a convincing argument that the ISTA standards are a better fit for your particular product, distribution environment, et cetera, go for it. Uh, every day they, uh, we, we test medical devices to all different standards, so there's no particular reason to use one versus another. It's up to you to prove which one's best for your particular situation. Katie? Before I continue, Greg, do you have anything for us? Yeah, um, I got the results from the poll you asked about. It looked uh, Nobody is currently using the 7386 standard, 
and um, we had about 22% or 17% of the people using the ISTA standards and 22% of the folks using ASTM. So that's good information to have. Thanks everybody for participating in the poll. Yes, thank you everybody. So let's continue. So the next category is puncture. It is a test method for slow weight penetration resistant of flexible barrier films and laminate. The standard is ASTM F1306. So it evaluates the characteristic of the flexible barrier films and laminate using the slow weight penetration resistant a driven probe. The current revision is 1990. There is no previous revision as this is the initial release and it still has not been technically or procedurally changed as far as what is done. So we will continue. So the next category is seal strength. This is also known as peel testing. The standard is ASTM F88 slash F88M. Current revision is 2009. The previous revision is 2000. So if you're wondering what the M stands for, it basically means that the ASTM committee went through the whole document and made the primary units to be metric. There are no changes to the testing procedure. Here is a picture of what a pill testing looked like. So you can see there is a sample in the middle of the jaw. This is the unsupported technique. There are three techniques for the standard. There is the unsupported, the supported 180 degrees, and the supported 90 degree. As display is the unsupported method technique. So there's a video on our website that you can see this test input being done. Herb, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, Katie, this, this is basically a TETSL test machine that we see. And uh, the, the, uh, the load cells are, are very important because this is a this is only about a one pound pull, so there's not a lot of uh, force involved uh, over an inch in the material. A question ar arose earlier, uh, is, is the manufacturer's uh, seal uh, different than the, uh, than the uh, uh, device insertion seal? In other words, when you buy a pouch, uh, let's say, uh, typically it has three side seal on it. You insert the product and seal the fourth side. Uh, and that's typically the bottom, the one that the, uh, is not intended to be opened in the sterile field. Uh, so the question was whether or not there should be a difference between those those two, and, and uh, you know, is there a standard for the uh, for the fourth seal? And the answer is there are no standards that we're aware of. Um, if it's intended that the device uh, be dispensed from the pouch on the chevron seal, typically the top, typically on the top. Uh, then those devices should be, you know, tested to that particular uh, standard, and it's important to, to make sure that the standard that the seals are consistent, not necessarily minimum levels. We're not interested in that so much, but we are interested in consistent levels, and they should be sufficient to maintain integrity, but not so so much that the you know, the one nurse, often called the dirty nurse, who are, who takes the, uh, the the package and opens it onto the sterile field in an aseptic manner as best they can. They tend to get pretty nervous and sometimes pretty darn upset with seals that are inconsistent. So if the bottom one is, tends to be uh, uh, more uh, integral, maybe uh, you know three pounds per inch or, or ten pounds per inch, if it's intended to uh, to be that way, so be it. There's no there's no rules to say it has to be one thing or another, uh, but they should in fact be consistent. That's the important thing, Katie. So another test method I want to emphasize is the internal personalization failure resistance of unrestrained packages. It's also known as the burst testing. The standard is ASTM F1140 slash F1140M. The current revision is 2013. Previous revision is 2007. There are no changes to the testing procedure. They added M, as I mentioned before, to make it such that the primary unit is in metric. So here's a picture of burst testing. This is a closed package technique. So in other words, none of the seals is cut off and then subjected to testing. All the seals are intact, so you inject air to it, blow it up to as big as possible like a balloon, and have it pop. With this particular test method, the stress are not uniformly distributed to the areas of the package, mainly the seals. 
because it inflates and the maximum diameter is in the middle. It may not detect the weakest area of the seal. However, there is another standard that would detect the weakest area of the seal. This is the ASTM F2054-F2054M. Current revision is 2013. Previous revision is 2007. There are no changes to the testing procedure. This is the restrained burst testing. So what it does is basically you inflate the pouch, and the pouch is restricted by plates such that the stress will be uniformly applied to perimeter of the package, meaning the seals. And it will detect the weakest area of the seal because pressure is being applied to burst open the package. Before I continue, it looks like Greg has some questions. Um, we do, and first let me say that we do have a large volume of questions today, and if we don't get to them, we'll come back around to you after the webinar and uh, get back to you. But I have one that relates back to the peel test method. Um, if a peel test method is not specified, is there a default one that we would recommend using, and what is the most common one that is used? I'll take that question, Her. So. The method that we recommend or the technique we recommend to our customer is the unsupported method. So that technique allows that the sample, the fin seal, to freely move. So imagine that motion as if, like her mentioned, the dirty nurse opening the package. It more simulates the real world of it is the more conservative method. The other popular test method is the supported 180 which will have a backing plate behind the sample and as you peel. Um, there are beliefs that this particular test technique, the supported 180, provides more consistency compared to the unsupported because you are restricting the fin seal from moving however it wants to move. As being an engineer doing these type of tests, I have standard deviation down to 0 0.8. 03 using the unsupported technique. So it does not matter which technique you use as long as you're consistent. Your manufacturer for the pouches probably have one particular technique because one technique will yield different results compared to another technique. So once you do you pick a test and you get five pounds, you get two pounds, you're like, why aren't they matching? So just ask them, I'm pretty sure they know the technique. Great. Thanks, Katie. Okay, our last category is the visual inspection, and the standard is ASTM F1886-F1886M. Current revision is 2009, previous revision is 1998. They added M to signify that the primary units are metric. They replaced medical packaging with flexible packaging, and there are no changes to the testing procedure. So I want to touch base and inform our audience that there could, there is a future test method change. It relates to the performance testing ASTM FD, I'm sorry, ASTM D4169. They're proposing the change of truck and or, or air vibration spectrum and the duration. We anticipate this change will take place in about one to three years from now. So as far as FDA recognition, as I mentioned before and her mentioned as well too, that the ISTA test procedures are not recognized by FDA on their website. But don't worry, we have customers who do use them and do get FDA approval. As her mentioned before, that it doesn't matter which test procedure you use as long as you can justify it. So we anticipate that in the near future that ISTA will be recognized. And this is the website. I went on and I typed in ISTA. As you can see, when I typed in ISTA on the FDA website, it does not come up as recognized. When I typed in ASTM D7386, it is recognized in here on the FDA website. So we have reached the conclusion of our webinar. and. We'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us, and we hope this was informative as it was fun for us to present. Um, we do have a few more questions, and it looks like we do have some time here. So let's start with the one uh, 
can you comment broadly on the severity of D4169 versus ISTA is one more severe than the other? And also, you may want to roll in 7386 into that. Uh, that's a, an interesting question. That's a, not not necessarily a curveball. It's like 14 curveballs all at once. Um, severity of the two. Um, there's a 19 distribution cycles in ASTM D4169, and there are some uh, 30 different ISTA procedures now. So it all depends on which one you pick. Uh, they have different uh, drop heights, for example, for the uh, ISTA uh, 2A, for example, has a drop height of 38 inches. Um, ASTM D4169 in one of the distribution cycles has a drop height, a final drop height of double the initial drop height, and I believe uh, for the lightest package, that's going to wind up being in the neighborhood of 48 inches. So those things vary. It depends on which one you pick, um, which one's more appropriate. Um, the vibration input levels, mm, again, Coke and Pepsi or apples and oranges, as Katie would prefer. Um, so it, it's really hard to say which one's more severe. Um, they, 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 both both committees, I've, I've actually uh, I'm very uh, interested in and knowledgeable of both both those committees. Actually, there's, there's about four or five different ones in the ASTM arena. But they're all composed of knowledgeable people, and they all make a reasonable uh, decisions and judgments based on the information available to them. So I, I don't have any particular uh, unkst, if you will, for either one of them, um, as, as as far as uh, how they go about doing what they're doing, and you can't really say uh, which one's more severe because they're they're just very different. That's that's about the best non-answer I can give for that question. Are there any others, uh, Greg? Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. The next question. Do, 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 where are we here? Uh, when performing seal strength tests, do you randomize the seal location? Where you do the peel, where you pull the peel samples from. Just want to double check. Are you talking about manufacturer seal and in-house seal? Is that what the question is pertaining? I think it's more pertaining if you have like a 12-inch long seal. Do you pull it from the six-inch location in the center of the seal, or do you randomize the location along the seal width? Okay, so for that question. When we do peel testing, as her mentioned before, it is the key factor of being consistent. So if you have a 24-inch long seal and you pick the 6-inch location to take it, then you should stay consistent with the sample. Bear in mind that if you take a sample at the 6-inch or the 7 inches, there could be variation in, within itself because sealing parameter does not really give you exact number for within each area. So there are slight variation. But we try to tend to stay at the six if you request the six. Pearl, would you like to add? Just from a uh, conceptual standpoint, if, you, if you're going to randomize the location that you select for the, the appealable samples in this particular test, you're doing a validation on the sealing machine more than on the, the actual package itself. So once you have the sealing machine validated, uh, you, you should, uh, or in that process, you should you know, randomize your, your uh, samples in order to make sure that it's consistent all around the pouch. If you have a 24-inch long pouch, as, as Katie mentioned, uh, you, sh you should assure yourself that that sealing bar that, that creates that, either it's the in-house seal or the, or the, uh, the pouch seal itself, uh, that, that it should be consistent. When you get to the actual package performance test, you're more interested in making sure that one pouch is consistent uh, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. So the, that process would be better facilitated by using a more consistent location for all of the, the seals rather than randomizing it at that point. Uh, by that time, you should, you should know that the, the, uh, uh, the process of making the pouch is consistent. That should have been done long before you're actually using the darn thing. So I would, I would vote for being, con being more consistent with the location of those uh, seals when you're doing the actual uh, validation and package performance. Great. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, next question is, what is the best way to attach the needles for the package for a gross leak test? It sounds like this question is talking about the testing procedure for the bubble testing. Is that right? 
Yeah, that is that is correct. So, as you're injecting needles, depending on the gauge and what testing equipment you are using, you want to ensure that the needle you inject into the package does not further propagate the hole that you put it in. So there are several techniques or several methods you can use. You can either use tape to cover so it doesn't further propagate for a foil or a poly material, or sometimes some of the paper or type of material, if you inject the needle, it doesn't propagate, so it should be fine. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we still have some more questions, but we'll respond to them offline because we're running out of time here and we know everybody's time is valuable. So do you guys have anything else to add before I wrap it up? Yes, I actually do. I want to go back to this conclusion. So if you ever find yourself confused and don't know about standards as far as what it is or the latest revision, please think of Westpac and we're here to support you as far as keeping you up to date. You can just give us a call, let us know if you have any questions. We are more than happy to keep you up to date so you will be less frustrated and move on with your daily tasks. Herb, do you want to add something as well? Uh, briefly, Katie, I do, you certainly did a great job there and, and I want to just kind of uh, tail back on, on, on piggyback on what you said that uh, we do this because our, our clients um, are very important, uh, crucially important. They're, they're, they're very valuable to us and so we try to keep on track of, uh, of the standards as best we can and even participate in some of the committees that, uh, that create the standards uh, so that uh, that's, that's one less burden on, on our, our clients, our customers, because uh, you're, you're the folks that uh, are on the firing line there. You have to face the FDA. We don't, but we certainly want to assist in that process. And if we can as, uh, assist in, in, in a way like keeping up to speed on the change in the standard, we can do that, and we do do that. And, and we do that because it's a service for people who uh, uh, hopefully will use our services and therefore we can uh, help one another in the process. So we really want to thank our clients uh, for the ability to serve them in this particular way. Uh, we enjoy it, it keeps us busy, it keeps us employed, and we're all smiles. So thank you very much. Cool. Well, I'd like to tell Katie and Herb, thank you very much for the webinar today. Um, if you missed anything or would like to listen to the webinar again, please check out Westpac's website at www.westpac.com under the events tab. The webinar should be uploaded shortly. Um, check our website under upcoming events for our next webinar in June. If you have any questions, please submit them to webinar at westpac.com. That's W-E-B-I-N-A-R at westpac.com. If there are any other webinars you'd like us to see us offer, please also submit them to webinar at westpac.com. We were sending out a survey um, following up the webinar here. Please fill it out as we are always looking to improve the process. I'm Greg Swinghammer. Thank you for attending. Make it a great day.